today. We do so good. Your mercy endures forever. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your word, your will, and your way. We thank you for every person now that is here under the sound of my voice. We know, Father, of course, corporately for this service, you've got a plan tonight, purpose tonight, things you want to say, things you want to do by the Spirit, of course, revelation from the word. But to the individual, Father, there's a plan and there's a purpose you have for each and every one of them, Father. And Father, we just thank you tonight, Father. I thank you that I'm going to be a vessel that's yielded to you. Meet ready and prepared for the master's use. And as we yield to you now, Father, and as we all come together and make that expectancy and that demand by faith in the name of Jesus, not expecting something from man, but expecting from you, Father, to move mightily, Father, to hear from heaven, Father, tonight. To hear what the Holy Ghost would have to say in this place, Father. We thank you, Father, as we've said. We've said our faith and we believe that we're going to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is well able to save our souls. And we thank you, Father, as we receive it. As we act on it, as we leave this place. As we act on the word, Father, it's going to produce fruit. And not only will our lives be changed, Father, we're going to be a light to this world to show them the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that is in Him. Father, we just thank You now. As I believe we might have already said, but we say again, have Your way in our lives, in this place tonight. Say what You want to say. Do what You want to do. We don't have a, a rigid uh, set of rules or, or things we must follow. We must follow You. We must follow Jesus. Yes, we must yes. follow the, the God, the direction of the Holy Spirit. So now we just thank you, this service, this time, and us, we are yours, Father. And just move mightily upon us, Father, and we thank you these lives will be changed, challenged, and ordered forever. But most importantly, we thank you everything that's said and done is going to glorify, magnify, and honor your holy and mighty name right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. You know, it's been said that the greatest predictor of future action is past action. But when you make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life, as we've been studying and as we've been in the Word, that my Father and your Father is no longer Satan. Amen. I'm not ruled and dominated by sin, not ruled and dominated by sickness, disease, or the Father of them all, Satan. Amen. Amen. Our Father is now the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm one of His children. You're one of His children. Amen. And we're in the family of God. We got a new spiritual day, DNA, you could say. Amen. And it's one of a champion, one of an overcomer, one of a more than more than a conqueror. But in saying that, the Bible tells us repeatedly that we must be on guard. You got to guard your heart. You got to guard what you hear. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear. You got to make a covenant with your eyes, amen. And we, I was going, and I'll tell you why and why not here shortly, because it's part of this message. I was going back to the message, dead but alive, and going to go back to Romans chapter six, and we can look at seven and and maybe even eight. We're not going to do that tonight. But in Romans chapter six, it talks about that I yield my. Let, let's look at that real quick before we go to Hebrews eleven. We're going to look at Romans chapter six. We've been talking about this. This We're not going to the same message because i got a specific one for tonight. But I know that sin does not have dominion. Romans 6, going down to verse 15. Sin does not have dominion over me. That's further up 14 and 11 and, and, and several other ones. <clears throat> but sin and, and synonymous are, are and sin and Satan, excuse me, are synonymous terms. Sin doesn't have dominion over me because Satan doesn't have dominion over me. I've been given authority, and you have to, over all the power of the enemy. And, and you'd say, well, he's doing this and doing that and, and doing the other in my life. It's, it's, I think it's more right to say, and I would say even in my own life, he may be challenging our authority. But as long, as long as we hold fast to the promise of the Word of God, and as long as we continually exercise our authority, no matter how much he challenges our authority, we're going over and not under. Amen? Amen? But we got a decision to make. We got things that we must do, right? And if you go on down to Romans chapter 6, verse 15, what then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Verse 16, know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death 
of obedience unto righteousness. And the Dates Bible says this. If you got one, you read it before we read verse 17. It says, change in acts of obedience indicates a change in masters. When God becomes my father, I don't act like I used to act and don't do what I used to do because my allegiance has changed. Amen. Amen. He said, but God, verse 17, but God be thanked that you were. In my Bible, I already had it underlined, but that's also in parentheses. You were the servants of sin, but I'm not anymore, right? Amen. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. But it says up in verse 16, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, we just say that's whose servants you are. Even as a Christian, you choose to yield to obey or to disobey the word of God. To obey the word of God or to disobey the word, to hold fast to the word or when you get under pressure, to let go of the word. What I do with the word of God is not up to God, but up to me. Yes. Yes, amen. amen. And as I would say, go back to Hebrews 11 verse 1. This is a, one of those Holy Ghost messages. Matter of fact, I went on this evening and was just, I wouldn't say laying, but sitting up in the bed and was studying, really just reviewing, because I'd already studied what I was going to do. But, but the Lord changed what I was ministering tonight, and of course we're getting into it right now. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, I think I've ministered this title, not this particular message, uh, but you might could look up some of my messages and find this title. But again, it's a different message. We're going to talk tonight for a little bit about walking by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. We're going to start out in Hebrews 11, verse 1. And it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of what? It's the th evidence of things not seen. If we go on down to verse 3, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not, were not made of things which do appear. If we went back to Genesis, God said, God spoke, and it was. Yes, he spoke when it didn't look not only not good, when he spoke, there was nothing there. Amen? Amen. He spoke those things into existence. The worlds were framed by the Word of God. Your world will be framed by the Word of God in your life, or honestly, it will be framed by whatever word you speak because you're going to have what you say. And the devil's going to challenge you every step of the way to remove you from the promises and from what God's spoken to you in his word. Yes, Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't want to say we need to expect that, but it really doesn't matter because that's going to take place whether you expect it or not. Again, he's going to endeavor to challenge your authority. But put up Hebrews 11 verse 1 in the Amplified Version. We're going to look at this, as I said, brief, briefly tonight. I'm even going to tell you how the message came about and, and, and as I was when the message changed I was sitting there studying in the bed and the Lord spoke to me and he started talking to me about Abraham and Sarah uh, about speaking the word of God and talking about uh, the way that it looks and again I'll tell you more about this in a minute but he said there's going to be at least one person uh, and, and I don't know how this applies I do not know if it's financially I do not people say were well, you talking about somebody's life I don't know how it applies but he said there's at least one person there's going to be in your congregation tonight that if they do not stop being moved by what they see is over concerning the area that they were trusting me in. Now, I don't know what that means, what area that would be. But what I am saying is, is it's time to not be moved by what we see and get our eyes fixed back on what will change your life always for the better, and that's the Word of God. Yes, Amen? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, faith is the assurance the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. <coughs> a lot of people say, well, I hope things will change one day. Well, they'll change if we'll put some faith with our hope. Amen? <laughs> Being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction 
of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact. Faith perceiving that is so. What is not revealed to the senses. Just because you see it doesn't mean that it's not so and that it can't be so. Just because every feeling you have is opposite doesn't mean the word of God is made of none effect unless you go by what you see. Unless you go by what you hear that contradicts the word. Unless you go out by what other people say. Faith perceiving is real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Now all the scripture is important, but I just highlighted some and it's still up here. It says, now faith is, the first part's important too, but faith is the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving is real fact. What is not revealed to the senses is true because the word says so and nothing else is necessary for it to be so because Jesus said, my word, God said, my word is truth. A lot of people have situations and circumstances in their life that dictate a, a message that is opposite of the word of God and they'll not say what they know the word says because they see something that contradicts it. And they'll say this even to me. I'm not going to lie. It is not a lie to say that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus when everything in my body feels opposite. Because the highest form of truth is God's word. Amen. It is not wrong to say, especially if you're a tither and giver, you've got to qualify. It is not wrong to say if today you're in the worst financial shape that you've ever been in, you tithe and give and you're facing financial attack. It is not wrong or a lie to say, I thank you, Father, that I'm abounding with the blessings of God, that people are looking to me to bless me. Business opportunities are opening up greater than I could ever think or imagine. Because you said you do exceedingly, abundantly above anything and everything that I ask or think. That's not a lie if everything in your life dictates otherwise. Amen. That's speaking the truth of God's word. Amen? Yes, amen. These are not going to be on this computer, I don't believe. But, but Knox translation says this. It says what? This is Hebrews 11 verse 1. It says, what is faith? It is that which gives substance to our hope, which convinces us of things we cannot see. Many of us have what we see up here in God's word down here because we're focused over here instead of what God said. And we got to get focused back on the promises. Amen. So we can fix this problem that we've had by being moved by everything but God's word. Moffat says, faith means to, that we are confident of what we hope for. We are convinced of what we do not see. But I've just highlighted, you can't see my notebook, obviously. But I've highlighted all of these. It says, faith means that we are confident of what we do not see. I don't see it. I may not hear it. I may not feel it. But it's so because God's word says so, and I say so. Amen? Because God's word is just as powerful in my mouth as it is in his mouth. Why? Because it's still God's word and he's given it to me to use. It is not wrong. It is not a lie to say you're more than a conqueror when you feel like the least of all. Because God said so. And we got to act on the word of God. Amen? It actually brings a reproach on the Lord Jesus Christ when we call ourselves failures and all of these sorts of things. Amen? When I am truly in faith, I am not moved by my senses, sight, feelings, hearing, whatever it may be, because my faith, what does my faith rest on? That's going to bring these results in my life. That's going to bring these hopes into reality. My faith rests on the word of God and nothing else, and my faith never changes. So even though I'm going to face the storm, even though I'm going to be, my authority is going to be challenged. Even though I'm going to have some things that I feel in my body that contradict healing for sure. I'm going to hold fast to the word of God. And no matter where I'm at today, naturally, I know that I received the end of my faith from the beginning because I refuse to turn it loose. 
Because I'm not going to let go, right? Yeah, I'm going to hold fast to what God says. Thank you. I just asked you, we could talk about all the senses, but I know what the Holy Ghost said when I was laying in my bed today or sitting there studying. And he said, there's people that's drastically being moved by what they see right now. And he said, they'll be in service tonight. Don't preach another message. You preach this one because they got to stop looking at what they've been looking at or they're going to head in the wrong direction. I've used this numerous times before. When we was growing up, and it wouldn't be said about Uncle Charles because I think he didn't get that. He's a carpenter and could do all the lines and stuff. But Daddy and Papa and, and my Daddy and, and is on the other side now, Papa and different ones, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't draw a straight line if their life depended on it. And they always talked about it. But I remember, you know, we get down there and we'd be uh, dissing up the land or whatever. If, if you, you you got this long field. <clears throat> well, if you want to get in the, if you want to, you say, well, I want to go in a straight line. Well, you got to get your eyes. Papa would always tell us, and he probably figured this out younger. He said, get your eyes fixed. You might be here. But if you want to go there, you got to get your eyes fixed on one point. And then you won't be going way off over here and way off over there. If you keep your eyes fixed and you keep your focus fixed, then you'll end up where you're focused on. Yeah. But you've got to keep your eyes fixed. Something comes up over here or over there and you're looking this way and looking that way. You get to the end and you look back and it, it's a mess. It's the furthest thing from a straight road. You could have got there a lot quicker if we'd have paid attention and, and made our mark. Our mark as Christians, our aim, we would say, well, you say all the time, our aim is to be Jesus. Yes, but Jesus and the Word are one. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You say, I'm abiding in Jesus. I'm abiding in the vine. That's abiding in the Word. Amen? Yeah, it's yeah. abiding in the Word. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. <clears throat> it kind of is where we got the title from, which the Holy Spirit gave it to me anyways. But of course, the Spirit and the Word always agree. Right? For we walk how? We walk. That's daily, nightly, every day. That's not Sunday morning or Thursday night. And it would be then too. But we walk by faith and what? Not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Amplified says, in, in a short version of it, we walk by faith, not by sight or appearance. Not by sight or appearance. Now, I don't normally share some of these things because I'm, I'm kind of a private person myself, but the Lord, this is how this message came about. I, I was sitting in the bed and, and studying dead uh, but alive today and you know I've been facing even myself some physical challenges the last little while but largely some of my family has as well all of us have but but with my back and make a long story short we went this morning or midday to have an MRI you go in and the lady asked you you know she said you fill out all the paperwork I've had five or six of them so it's not really that big a deal to me and they said you know are you claustrophobic no I'm not claustrophobic I have no problem whatsoever. You can slide me in there. Been in there long as 45 minutes. I know how to control my mind. I know how to, you know, no problem. I know what to do. And there's several things that you do. You lay up on there. She says, put your arms up there. Be still. Don't breathe hard. Do nothing. You got a little ball to squeeze so she can pull you out real quick if you get scared or coughing or something or another. But, but what I know and, and what I do is I get in my fixed position. Another thing I do is I close my eyes. And, and of course, from the time I slide in to the time that I, she says, you're done, I pray and seek God. Spend a lot of time praying the Holy Ghost. But while I was in there today, I was sitting there, and, and she put this thing over my head that was different than usual, but I was sitting there in this machine. And, and you know, I've had, I've had no problems whatsoever with keeping my eyes closed. I'm praying you know, about life and all this kind of stuff and ministry and family and I'm just seeking God, you know, right to myself, not out loud. And and, and I, I moved my mouth a little bit and something hit my chin. <laughs> and, 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 I'm, and I'm, the first thought was, that's a little closer than usual. <laughs> so then, you know, that I'm, this, this, is, this isn't normal. And I've never had a problem, one, not one. And, and, and this thing hit my chin and I'm thinking, now my nose is further up, up than my chin. And, and when she gets done with this thing, because I didn't see how it was set up, honestly. 
Now, I, I close my eyes before she ever slides me out. And, and I'm thinking, now, if she just slides me out of this thing, this thing's out to cut my nose. <laughs> and, and, and so my natural reaction, I've never had any problems whatsoever, claustrophobia, because I'm really, really, I don't, I mean, it's, it's faith in God, trust in God. I can control myself pretty good with no problems. Control my emotions and senses and all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I just, all of a sudden, I opened, up, I opened my eyes in there. And open my eyes and it wasn't a good inch. And I'm thinking immediately, I closed my eyes right back, and there was a all over me real quick. It was like a spirit of fear. Come real quick. And I and of course, just like anybody anywhere, first thing you have is do these do they have a generator? You know, I know, I know there's no storm outside, but I know as big as I am shoved up in this hole in there. I know that I can't wiggle to get out. There's no way. And especially I can wiggle this way, but there ain't no way I can wiggle out where my feet came out. And of course, it's not cloudy or nothing, but you think, what would happen in all reality if something happened to this girl out here physically or, you know, where she didn't even know what was going on? Or what would happen if the tire went out and I'm stuck in there? And, and immediately, if for the first time ever, I've never had a problem uh, whatsoever, zero, Immediately, I, I honestly, a spirit of fear came, but immediately I had to make a decision. You're going to squeeze a little ball and tell the girl you're scared? You know, you need your blankie. Or you go go back to, to doing what you know to do. So I got good sense and closed my eyes and I started praying and seeking God. Well, to make a long story short, maybe the rest of the, this time is only 20 minutes, I've been in there longer before, but to make a long story short, you know, my, my problem immediately ceased. When I got back to doing what I was supposed to be doing. But then I, I, I don't know more about that. And I've never usually used current events in my life in the message. But I got home and began studying that message. And, and I've been studying another message. And the, Lord, and the Lord brought back to me. And he started talking about Abraham and Sarah. And he started talking about Peter in Matthew 14. When Peter was walking on the water. And he talked, when Peter had his problem. When did Peter have a problem? Peter's walking on the water. He said, Jesus, if that's you, just tell me. Get out of the boat. He said, are you knocking Peter? No, he didn't. He did more than most Christians because he actually got out of the boat. The rest of them was over there crying. Amen. He did get out of the boat, but he got out of the boat and everything's going, all the storm and all this kind of stuff. And what did Peter do? He got his eye, When he got his eyes on what was going on, he got his eyes on the circumstances and the situation immediately where he was walking on the water, he began to sing. He wasn't singing because it was God's will. He wasn't sinking because the word of God wasn't true. He wasn't sinking because the word don't work. That's not why he was sinking. We're not sinking for any of those reasons. Amen. We're not sinking because Jesus is not the deliverer. Amen. Amen. We're not dying because Jesus is not the healer. That's not the problem at all. Amen. But immediately, and the Lord said, he said, immediately when you open your eyes, he said, you were moved by what you saw. And he said, how'd you get it straight? I said, I closed my eyes and got refocused. He said, there's at least one person tonight that is in your congregation that they must now close their eyes and get refocused on the Word of God. Because I'm praying and seeking God while I'm in there, and I'm praying about me. I'm praying about Lee. I'm praying about us. I'm praying about the church. Number one, I'm not even happy that I'm there to begin with uh, <laughs> at all. And I don't preach against doctors. I'm not against doctors by any means, but I don't believe it's God's best. And I believe we're going to get to a place where we trust God in every situation like the saints of old did to such a degree that we're going to receive and walk our healing out and we're going to be an example greater than ever before no matter what we face. But I don't preach and teach against doctors. I've never taught you guys that. If my family needs to go to the doctor to maybe find out this, that, or the other, that's fine. And, and I live out the same thing. But while I'm laying there and I'm, I'm saying, and I'm praying, I'm saying, God, I need to do this and I need to do that. And, you know, what about this and what about that? And in a lot of my prayers, and personally, especially recently, is God, you know, I'm searching my heart. That ought to be the number one prayer of your life, too. Yes. Everybody. I'm searching my heart. And, you know, Lord, I want to know. You know, show me anything wrong. Show me anything I'm doing that's this, this causing a hindrance. And, and you know, the, even this physical attack in my life, I want to see. I want to know. What do I need to do that I'm not doing? Because I'm not just laying around all day, every day. I go and I do all that I can because I can't stand it. And, and then, yes, I do lay down and I get up and I go again. And, yes, I, I'm going to the doctor, but I'm holding fast to the Word of God. And I know that by the stripes of Jesus... 
that I am healed. And, and you know, but sometimes it can seem like in the natural, especially if you go by what you see, even a lot of times when you believe in God for healing, it doesn't matter the area, but a lot of times you start believing God for healing, you start feeling worse than you did before you started praying. A lot of times you start believing God for financial outpouring that He promises you in the Word of God, and you get five bills that you didn't even know was coming. Amen. Amen. What does that mean? What does it have to do with the Word of God? As I was laying there, the Lord spoke to me. And the only reason I'm using this is because obviously it was for me. But, but, but it would be for you as well, or He wouldn't have me to speak it tonight. He said, Son, I promised you all of these things. And He told me numerous things that He's told me in the Word and, and what He said to me personally and what He said about me and Laura Lee. You know, those things are personal. But, but He said, I promised you all of these things. He said, I've given you my promise. He said, there's only one question. He said, what are you going to do with it? He said, if you hold fast to the promise, this is nothing but a temporary hindrance. It's nothing but a temporary setback. He said, but if you hold fast to the promise, everything that I promise you, it'll come to pass, and it does not rest upon anything that's happening or going on right now. But the enemy always comes to challenge your authority and to see through circumstances, situations, all that's going on in your life, he wants you to let go of the promise that God is giving you. What has God told you? What has God promised you? Maybe some of you tonight need to pick up some visions you've had. Need to pick up some dreams you've had. You know, I've dealt with people and I've been there before. That God told you some things and you knew that it was right in your heart. But it, but so, not that you didn't trust God or, or even endeavor to get away or live it in sin. But you had so many things that were bombarding you and so many things on you that it's just like, my Lord, I'm just going to make it through today. And, and you let go of something God said. And when you let go, that's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you to let go of the promise of God because the only reason the enemy endeavors to get you to continually quit is for this reason. He can't take you out of it. He can't take you out of it. Well, he can't defeat you at will. But if he can get you to give up on the Word of God, you'll be defeated. You'll be defeated. If he can get you, to, to, even today, and that may be natural, as spiritual ramifications, it goes along with what I'm preaching. But you know, and I'm joking about mashing the little ball and all this kind of stuff and, and, and getting in the fear. Well, you yield to the spirit of fear. Yeah. But I had to immediately do what? Get focused back on God's promise, God's word, what God said. Praying in the spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost, seeking God. And there's a peace that passes all understanding. Amen? Yeah, amen. It doesn't have to be as hard as we make it sometimes. Amen. We try to do it if we're not careful. Half us and half God. We're just going to have to trust God and God. You know, it's not my way to figure out how you're going to do this, that, and the other. All I can do is hold fast to what you said. Amen. But we cannot overcome and focus on what produces doubt and unbelief. Right? What produces faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What has God said? Am I saying what God says? Am I acting on God's word? Am I listening to the good report of God's word? Are we doing that tonight? We've got to get refocused. Yeah. Now, don't you look at Romans 4 real quick. Romans 4, chapter 17. <clears throat> and you could go back and read the whole chapter, I think, in Genesis 17 or so, and 18 as well, I believe. This is just brought over into the New Testament. And, and commented on and then we know that Abraham <clears throat> was the father of many nations but in verse 17 Rome, Romans 4 verse 17 and you could say yep but you don't know what's going on and how bad it is you need to understand even a no in this world is not necessarily a no of God you just hold fast to the word of God and God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Yes, See, what happens is, is we get our eyes and I know that sounds, you say, we just keep saying the same thing. It's the problem. We get our eyes off of God's word. God's word is what's going to produce the fruit of whatever he's promised you. God's word is what's going to bring you out of your situation, out of your circumstances. Not what you think, unless you are put on the mind of Christ, but not what you think naturally, not how you feel, Right? The word works, but it only works when I work it. Amen. Amen. It's good to go to church if necessary, and you learn in church, but it produces no fruit if you don't receive it and take it and act on it. Doesn't do anything. 
Right? Yeah. Romans 4, 17, as it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed. <clears throat> Even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things that be not as though they were. Calleth those things that be not as though they were. If you're going to come up out and over from where you're at, you're going to have to call those things that be not as though they were in your life. Yes, if you're right. sick, you're going to have to find the promises of health and healing in the Word, and that's what you're going to have to speak. If you're a person of poverty, we got people around here in sickness as well, but we got people around here that the only reason that you have to struggle financially is because you've been trained in a poverty mentality. Amen. And until that mentality is changed with the Word of God, and you realize that God doesn't want you broke and poor, right. busted and disgusted. Amen? Amen. You say, it's not about having more. Nobody ever said it was about having more money than anybody else. But it is about being blessed. Yes. It is about you walking in the blessings of God to such a degree that people want to know, hey, how in the world you get to where you're at and you're able to tell them, my father takes care of me. That's right. You're able to tell them. It's a good witness. Yes. Amen. Amen? And then they'll be able to say, well, I know where you come from. That's even more witness. That's right. That's where I came from. It's good to have numerous, you know, I, numerous different stories. And, and, and John G. Lake, I, I studied some behind, still do. John G. Lake was a great man of God. But, and they had the bubonic plague. You know, they was having to wear all these suits and stuff. I remember the story about when he was there. And, and he uh, had several of his family die as well. But he started getting results. And, and I'm not going to tell the whole story how he got a hold of it. But, but he started praying for people and, and you got all the rest of them coming in and they and all of these, because it's extremely contagious and when you get it, you die. And they're coming in in all these suits and stuff and he's walking around, not necessarily dressed like me, but dressed, not, you know, no suit, we'd say. No, not dress suit, but no safety. What, yeah, hazmat, whatever it was in that day and time. There's no telling what it was. <clears throat> it might not fly today, but, but still, they was all protected in this kind of stuff and, and they wanted to know. <coughs> You know, what, what was, how in the world was he doing that? And he said, I'm, I'll show you. And they said, take some of that foam. I think it was foamed all around their mouths when they died and stuff. And, and there were people dead dying everywhere. And, and he said, and they took that foam and he said, here, I want you to put it, I think he said, put it on his hand. I don't know if they had to put it on the slide or whatever uh, to fit under the microscope. But he said, I want you to look at it when you put it in my hand. And they could see that it was alive initially, but they put it in his hand, and they were all amazed because when they put it in his hand, the law of the spirit, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. His answer was Jesus by his strike to his heel. He said the bubonic plague does not have power and authority over the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it would die immediately. But he made this statement, and it always helped me. It's not an excuse, but he said I had a dear brother. What was it was a brother in the Lord? He said I had a dear brother down the road here. Not, a, not his regular brother, but a brother of the Lord in the faith. And he said, he said, you know, he said, I, I thank God for it. But he said, he just trusts God. And he said, nothing ever comes by his house. No sickness or disease or anything. He said, and that's awesome. He said, but I can't say that I understand it. He said, because it seems as if though the devil endeavors to bring everything he can. And if anybody is going to catch it, it's going to come by my house. He said, but we're not going to put up with it. He said, it's come one right after the other. And he said, it's coming, but you take authority. Amen? You take authority. Don't tolerate what the devil is doing in your life. Don't just accept it as this is the way it has to be. Amen. If it contradicts the word of God, don't accept it. Amen? Amen? You're going to be challenged, but you don't have to accept it. Right? Yes, amen. So he said, who calleth those things that be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations. Which was, a, was what? According to that which was spoken. It's what God promised him. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith. He considered not his own body. Now dead. He, and now we know this. And all of you probably know this. But, but you got Abraham's about 100. And Sarah's wife's about 90. They're past childbearing age. And God says you're going to be the father of many nations because you're going to get Sarah pregnant and she's going to have a child. Well, going by any natural sense, that's a joke. Yes. Right? For him and her, because her womb's dead. He's past the point of obviously her uh, impregnating her with any fertile seed for sure. He's a hundred. He's all but dead. I mean, I'm, he's not dead in spirit. 
It takes a it takes a, a act of God. You say, well, he's alive in Christ. Yes, but his physical body is not 21 anymore. That would have been reality. I heard a minister say, you know, we ministered this about Abraham and Sarah, and people get this mentality that back then they was, you know, a hundred was twenty-one. He said, back then a hundred was a hundred. And most people that live to be a hundred, if they live that long, are not thinking about having their own children. <clears throat> not even when you get past me and Larlee's in our forties, and I thought I think that it would it would take a true uh, inner something intervention in Larlee's life if she was to get pregnant with a child right now. She wants grandchildren next, you know. <clears throat> and she, you know, we would uh, definitely, if she's pregnant, we'd have a good, healthy child. Right, Larlene? Yeah, she don't want to talk about it. See, she won't accept. She won't accept God's word. I don't know what's wrong with it. So, I was studying the other day with Abraham and Sarah where she called him Lord. I was looking at that definition. Man, that sounds good. It said master and possessor. Dear Lord. Yeah. All right. I know. Now only the men's going to receive the rest of the message. I'm still. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But uh, who against hope believed in hope that God would come to father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be, verse 19, and be not weak in faith. So he's got all these things we would say against what God spoke, against what God promised. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body when he was a hundred, and, and neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He had reason to choose doubt and unbelief, or reason to doubt, reason to say this is a joke. And remember when, even when God said this, uh, Sarah laughed. Right, that's why they named Isaac. Uh, Isaac. But still, <clears throat> at the same time, they had plenty of reason. Maybe tonight you got plenty of reason to give up on what God's promised you in His Word or promised you by the Spirit. But God's saying tonight to you, if you just hold fast to His Word, you just hold fast to the promise of God. Number one, primarily for this service, it don't matter what it looks like. Because that's what He had me to hide on. But it don't matter what it looks like. It don't matter what it feels like. It don't matter what other people say. God's word is true, but it only produces fruit in our lives when we act on it. Yes, amen. amen. What are you going to say? What does confession even mean? Confession means to say the same thing. When we're talking about God's word, confession means to say the same thing God says. So in all actuality, in all reality, to say I'm poor when he said that I'm rich and have abundant supply, the reality about it is when I say that I'm poor and I'm a Christian, is that I'm called a God liar. Yeah. Now I might not realize that I'm doing that, and thank God He's merciful. Paul said, you know, he was solid at that time, but that he, he did a lot of these. Thank God, you know, that he got received mercy because he did a lot of things ignorantly and unbelief. But when we get our minds renewed with the Word of God, God expects us to walk in the light that we have. So I'm rich and have abundant supply. No matter how I feel tonight, now, or when I get home, or earlier, I thank God I'm healed in Jesus' name. Amen. When the doctor tells you, you got this, that, and the other, and you're just going to have to live with it. You don't accept those things. You don't accept it. You don't have to fight with the doctor because it doesn't matter. And honestly, he may be, he's probably not lying. What he says, a lot of times he can show you and explain to you, but you've got to decide which report you're going to hold on to. Amen. Amen. We're going to hold on to the report of the Lord. Amen. Right? God's report, the good word of God. Oh, my gosh. Thank As you, I was praying about this message tonight, I said, Lord, you know, I, I don't have all the examples other people have, but we're just going to use the examples uh, that you uh, would have us to, because even in my life, <clears throat> just, the, just the amount of time that I've lived, longer than some of you, but not as long as others, there are so many times when it looked bad. It looked bleak. It looked like there was no way. You say, what did you change? Nothing if you're not doing anything wrong. Because it doesn't matter how bad it looks when you know that you're acting on God's Word. Amen. Amen. We come here and started this church, and it's always amazing what God brought it from. But there was times in between where we got to, and when we started out, that it didn't look real good. It didn't seem real good. And we was facing a lot of hell even in church. You say, what did you do? You just remember who sent you. And whoever sent you is big enough to keep you, Amen. especially when it's God. He's big enough to keep you and big enough to, to see you through. And now, thank God, we got an attraction by faith. 
people are attracted to people that trust God and their faith is in God. You ever notice people get not picking on nobody. God can cure this. I used to have a major, major problem with it. Insecurity and inferiority, whether anybody knew it or not, always thinking that you're less than and, and all this kind of stuff. And but when you get your identity in Christ. People are attracted to people, and I'm not talking about the wrong way, but they're attracted to people that know who they are and know where they're going. Yeah. Now, sometimes people get sideways, and we say, well, what if so-and-so does this? What if so-and-so does that? But we got the same answer. We're going to trust God. Yeah. We're going to trust God. What if this goes belly up or that goes belly up? We're going to trust God. God is our supply. Amen. We love everybody and it might come through man. That might be an avenue and it might be a way and it might be a means. But God is the source. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We thank God for all that the daughters can do. Not against none of them, but we thank God by the stripes of Jesus we're healed. Amen. Amen. From our head to our toe. We're going to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord no matter the report that we get. We've got people in here who've been dealing with different things and others ask me, well, concerning this, that, and the other, what are we going to do? We're going to do one or two things in our situation tonight. We're either going to hold fast to the word or we're going to let it go. That's right, amen. And if we let it go, we're going to be defeated. But if you hold fast to the word, understand, God's word will not return void, but it will accomplish the thing that it was sent for to accomplish. Yes, amen. Amen? Say, so I don't see it. That's the point of faith. If you saw it already, you wouldn't need faith. You wouldn't need faith. You already saw the answer. You already have the answer. What would you need faith for? Amen? It'd already be a reality even in the natural. But faith gives substance to things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Amen? <clears throat> I possess many things through my inheritance. That's laid out. What, what is this book? This Bible? It's broken up in the, broke in, in the Old and the New Testament. But it's actually the last. It's the Old and the New. The, it's a will and testament. And they go to the reading of the will to find out what's been left to you. To find out what belongs to you. Why do you need to get the Word of God? To find out what's been left to you by the Lord Jesus Christ. What belongs to you right now? It's a present possession. Amen? Amen? A lot of us, you know, he said in uh, Hosea 4, verse 6, I believe my people are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. <clears throat> right? But we're not going to be destroyed. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right? Yes. And the will of God begins where well, the word of God is known. Isn't that right? I say it backwards. You sure? Uh -huh. huh? Is that Mike? Yeah. Gotcha. Y'all got it right? You'll get Mike on CD? Yeah. So now where'd I stop? He's, he was not weak in faith. He considered not. And, and if you look up this word considered, it, it's what we do when we face opposition. We go to weighing. He, he, he could have went to looking at Sarah at 90, looking in his mirror in his cave at 100. You know, hey, God said we might have a child, but it don't. It doesn't look like that's the what we're the closest to. You know, by what we look, <coughs> right? But he considered not his own body when he was about a hundred and maybe a dead of He staggered not at the promise of God. What did he hold fast to? Number seventeen, as it is written. Number 20, he staggered not at the promise of God. What causes you to stagger at what God said? Through unbelief. But was strong in the faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded what? He was fully persuaded. He believed that what God promised. What is in this word? The promises of God in him are yes and amen. God's word is settled. As far as he's concerned. But it's my responsibility. To make the promises of God a reality in my life. And that happens by faith. Yes, no other way. Amen? Yes, amen. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised. He was also able to perform. You see that. It's right these down. Because we're not going to go to all of them. But in Hebrews 4.14. He tells us. 
It's 14 through 16. We read it regularly. It's good. We are to hold fast the profession or the confession of our faith. I want to ask you tonight, when you leave this place, number one, what have you been saying about what you're facing? Is it God's word? Does it line up with the word of God? You've been saying, I'm not going to make it. I was praying for this and then I just, you know, it, it, it naturally, not, not spiritually, not when you stay in the word. It can be frustrating when circumstances and situations, when you're standing on the word, when sometimes they get worse. You can, it can allow, if you allow it to, it'll cause you to be discouraged and frustrated, but that's actually when you've got to press in more. Amen? Hebrews 10.23 tells us to hold fast without wavering. And I'm going to close with Mark 11. 22. Mark 11. 22. 23 and 24. <coughs> and it pays to note you know, the, the entire story the day before, they're walking by the fig tree when Jesus was hungry. They cursed the fig tree on their missionary journey that day. They go on about ministering. Not they, Jesus cursed the fig tree in verse 14 and said, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter. And his disciples heard it. They heard it. It didn't say it died right there. Visibly. They didn't see. They didn't say it. Oh my Lord, Jesus cursed it and it just obliterated. It's gone. Immediately it withered and died. None of those things are spoken in the Bible. They heard it, so we can imagine they were right there beside Jesus when he did it, and they saw it too. Jesus spoke to and cursed the fig tree, and then they went about their day. Right? Let's back up to verse 20, and in the morning, this will be the next day, they passed by. As they passed by, they saw the fig tree. What does it say? Dried up from the roof. You know the first time you pray the prayer of faith, God hears and answers your prayers. You know that? Do you know the word begins to work immediately? It's why even when you don't feel it, even in, and physically, you believe God that the word has been sown. You're acting upon the word and it's working to bring a healing and a cure in your body, no matter how you feel, right? He said, it was dried up from the root. So Jesus spoke the day before, and they didn't see anything. You got that right? They didn't see anything, but did any, was anything happening when Jesus spoke? They didn't see anything, but he spoke, and it was dried from the roots, right? And Peter calling to remember, saith unto him, Master, Behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, what did he say? Same thing he said to us as disciples. Have faith in God. Is what you're saying tonight, is it, is it like Abraham? If you hold fast to the promise, you understand that glorifies God. Who would it glorify when we magnify what the enemy's doing? Well, it magnify him. The enemy, right? He said, Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Now we've got to ask ourselves about the words of our mouth. You know, I was just, just praying today again, the Lord was just, just showing me, dealing with me about different things. And he said this, he said, you know, about what you say. He said, are things like they are because of what you've been saying? Or we can flip that around. <coughs> are things like they are because of what you've been saying? Or what would be the reverse of that? <laughs> are things like they are because of what you've been saying? Or is what you've been saying cause things to be like they are? You understand? You yeah. said, where did it come from? This is just the Bible. Where did it come from? All the ghosts. That's what he said. Because it works both ways. You have what you say. Amen. You never find somebody, I don't care who they are, natural, definitely spiritual. You'll never find somebody a success that speaks failure all the time. They they despise it. They don't talk about that kind of stuff. You don't you don't find people that's over. You don't talk to them about that being a failure. They don't even want matter of fact, they'll have they'll have compassion when they get into work, but they'll have a hard time listening to you talk about being a failure for a long time. 
Because they listen to you for a little while and they know why you're in the situation you're in. Because you've got to change your mentality. You've got to change your thinking. You can't talk failure and be a success. It's impossible. It, we take it in the Word, and He said, He shall have whatsoever He saith. You need to be saying what God said about you and those things that He promised you. You know, even every time this church, uh, things didn't look good, things didn't look bleak. I have confessions that everybody just about knows. It's not a secret. But I go outside when nobody's here, especially when nobody's here. There have been many times that this congregation's been spoken over when nobody's here, and I stand right here. And I say, or I said then, what I now see. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen? But I didn't see it then. Mm -hmm. Went outside when there were just a few. And spoke and said, we got nowhere to put them. And not just numbers, lives being changed. Mm -hmm. And we hear about testimony. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Finances. Finances are the same way. I mean, not everybody would know it. But it's how you work with your finances. It's how you work in your... You know, there's different times, Miss Frankie, which you can't see money all the time. There's different times that you should say, all right, now, we need to move our numbers up. We need to move our numbers up. But we don't wait till the number. You say, what do you mean, move your numbers up? Well, if, you bring, if you're bringing in $1,000 a week, that ain't where you set your faith. That's right. Amen. We're bringing in $1,000 a week. It's going to be at least $1,500 a week we believe God for. We've got no less than $1,500 a week. Now, we wait above that. Don't get me wrong. But, but I'm just saying, if it's 1000 we move it up 1500 You say, what happened? Well, you trust God, and, and you'll see the finances. You say, how's it happen? I couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. nothing to me. You say, how's he going to do it? I could, I don't care. You don't know that, that's where you get in the way, and the reason you get in the way. Amen. Analytical, and you're trying to figure everything out. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I, I balance this. I'm fixing to let you go. But I balance this. It's why the more educated you are, you got to be careful. Yeah. you got to be careful. It's extremely hard for very educated people to trust God mm -hmm. because they analyze everything. And so you'll come to a place with God. You can analyze all you want to. There's no answer. Natural. There's no one. Amen. And you trust God, things will happen in your life that make no sense. They make no sense. They never make sense. And then people ask you different questions and you only got one answer. God. There is not another. But it's just come again recently with the finances. They keep going up, and we move them up $500 or $1,000 increments, and we move it up, we move it up, and so what happens? You say, that's foolish to believe God. You got three or $4,000 a week, but if you only got 2000 or twenty five, dollars no, it's not foolish. You have what you say, and we set our faith, and it goes up, and it goes up, and it goes up. It's been a matter of time. We're bringing in $10,000 a week. You say, is it all about money? No, but the more money we got, the more we can do. That's what it's about. That's why we're here. Amen. What things serve you desire, 24 says, last scripture tonight, he said unto you, what things serve you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. Well, number one, what's you, what do you want? And make sure it lines up with God's word. Meditate on the word. Don't find those scriptures that promise you that, and then you need to begin to speak the word. The number one person that you need to speak the word to is not God, it's not the devil, and it's not your neighbor. I believe the biggest person that you need to convince that the Word of God is true is you. Amen. Because you receive what you believe. You say they don't believe it. You don't receive it because they don't believe it or because they do. Amen. You receive when you believe it. And you'll be a light and example to other people. Amen. But I want to lastly say this. Because I'm going back to what the Lord told me today. I'm going to sit there studying in the bed. Whoever you are that are in this here and you're facing, you've been praying, you've been seeking God. And I would dare say that you haven't about been moved. You have been moved by what you see, what you are seeing, what you are looking at. Get your eyes back on the promise. Because it does not matter if every single thing in your life says what God promised is impossible. All things are possible to him to believe it. God can look at Smith River Worth, and I don't know if he said a hundred thousand or a million. It all matters a lot. He made this statement, Wigglesworth said. He said, God will jump over a hundred or a million people to get a hold of one person that will simply trust him. He's looking for men and women of God without faith, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 6, is impossible to please him. He's just looking for people that will take him in his word and not know him. Those people are you and me. And those people, you and me, are world changers in Jesus' name. Stand your feet.